do your presentation. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay, guys, um, this is going to be pretty informal. Um, I don't know if I stand up, if I stand up to do a presentation, I'm a pacer, so it's back and forth and back and forth. We're actually find better off to sit here. Um, the uh, the one megawatt turbine, on an average, is going to produce between 220 and 320 kilowatt hours per hour every hour, based on a 24-hour day throughout the entire year. But once again, I remember driving by the large turbine down at uh, the CNE many, many times and said, geez, it's windy and the thing's not running. What's up with that? Or the one over here at the Pickering uh, plant. It's, it's windy. Why isn't the turbine running? Why are they ignoring that wind? And the reality of it is, is that the wind was, it's, it's windy for us, but it's too not windy enough to turn that turbine at a high enough frequency where their inexpensive and inefficient conversion equipment can get at that low frequency electricity. Divided up our organization into four or five different components. So the power electronics component, the conversion equipment for wind and solar, I moved that into a company called Power Electronics. And that's all that company does. It's a separate mandate. Uh, and at that point, we had also decided that instead of keeping all this technology to ourselves and only building super economic sites of our own, which is, you know, nice from a financial standpoint, but maybe a little bit selfish in terms of the worldview, um, we put that in power electronics and we said, okay, we're going to start to market this technology to the world at large. Uh, hybrid on power generation became a company that was to own and operate assets that we build on our own. So large solar facilities, the one over here in, uh, on, uh, in Brownsville, so there's, there's an issue right there. Um, the reality of us, from a structural standpoint, balanced systems are really not the way to go. Um, if you do structural analysis, 95 out of 100 buildings will fail the test and not be able to withstand a, a balanced system on the roof. So the answer is what I call a percolating system. I designed in 2008 what I call a floating truss system, which basically in a building like this, you can see that you've got columns in here somewhere that are supporting these main beams. And in a situation like this, what I would do is I would put four perforations in the roof at the four corners on the columns, and I would have a truss system that would bridge between those supports. I'd have a longitudinal beam on both sides, and I'd have my solar arrays running between those longitudinal beams, any additional ballast weight. Most roofs uh, were designed to withstand snow loading. In the industry, when the solar panels were $3.50 and $4 a watt, by the time I put the structural stuff up on the roof, which is quite expensive, coupled with the high cost of the solar panels at that time, the systems were uneconomic. And now, from this point, and you know, if you ignore all this, and if you just go by what PV Watt says, this one's a winner. But if you actually map the data, if you actually track what it's doing day by day, and that's what we did, we pulled up their information from their website, we pulled up our information from our website, over the period of uh, the uh, monitoring, which is 129 days, we generated 89,305 kilowatt hours of electricity. We generated 84,000. So with an extra 30 odd percent worth of panels and inverter, they're generating less power. Our warranty started at 10, an extension to 20, or 30, or 30 right? Ours are actually designed to last, as Tom said, longer than 20 years, 25 years. So it's reasonable, I think, to expect that in about the 10th or 11th year, this array is going to have to go out and buy a new set of inverters. Somebody's house down, that's a problem. Uh, if you collapse somebody's roof, that's a problem. If the panel comes off in a high wind and it kills somebody in the street or goes through the windshield of somebody's car, that's a problem. I mean, aside from the reality, the personal reality of the personal injury aspect and the terrible losses that could be uh, faced with from a pragmatic and business standpoint, it's a big problem. And what's so, your position then with all the problems that are occurring? Please don't. What's your position on training and development? I think training and development is the most important thing. I've spent... We're not seeing enough of it though. You're not seeing enough of it and I applaud all of you both for being students and you guys for having given your students the opportunity in the venue to be trained properly in the, in the, because you're right, it's not happening in that room. So I actually thought about it. doing Terrible. this, to be honest with you. Yeah. I actually thought about, we, we've talked about it. We actually started back in 2006 going around to high schools and running seminars on the right and the wrong way, but the problem is the high school kids are too young, right? I mean, they all think it's a great idea, but 
they just don't have enough life experience to appreciate the magnitude of what it is we're talking about. Everybody in this room is mature enough to know that A, this is real, and B, you've got to do it right. I think, I think also to reach the youth, you've got to get past the stigma of the parents not giving a care anymore because they've never been listened to for a long time. That's right. So why, may, why raise your voice when no one's going to hear it anyway? Right. Interestingly enough, you know, what I did find that when we met with the students, I mean, the students are the greenest bunch of people you're ever going to meet as a rule. Well, they've been programmed that they've way. They've been programmed. Because they're being that way. Well, either way, the net result is the same. I mean, they're all about recycling, at least, you know, what we've seen. They like recycling. They like energy conservation. They may not practice it because they're all still having long showers and so on, but the reality of it is... <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> but, that, but they're all talking the good talk, right? Yeah. That's right. And they're going to be hired into large industries where... Uh, you know, in the computing industry, they're going to be thinking about energy efficiency, they're all going to be coming up with, these are the people that are going to be coming up with the next group of ideas, right? They're all, what we're hoping is, is that everybody is an in-the-box thinker, I know that's a heavily overused term, but from my perspective, my whole life has been about solving problems. I can, I walk in and I, I was in a solar plant manufacturing, uh, solar panel manufacturing plant yesterday, what day is today? Tuesday. <coughs> Beautiful plant completely roboticized, and I love robots, you know, I used to build them. And I'm walking through the plant, and I come to the end, I'm not going to tell you who it is, but I come to the end of the deal, this is, uh, it boggled my mind. I said, um, they kind of, I didn't see where they were putting the junction box on the back of the panel, and I said, I want to see that operation, because I have a pet peeve with solar panel manufacturers about the junction box, okay, and I'll tell you what that is. So, closer to uh, an existing <laughs> power generator. Well, you know what? Is that coincidence? <laughs> I, I don't know whether it's coincidence or not, but I'll tell you this. You know, on October 1st of 2009, when the FIT program was introduced, the OPA received, in the first 60 days during the launch period, 2,200 applications for renewable energy projects that were all across the board. There was biomass, there was solar, wind, hydro, you name it. So, and that was for 9,500 megawatts of generated electricity. See, Arab money on some of my projects. Mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and so that's definitely, uh, so the Europeans, they've run out of money. A lot of the, the, the political unrest we've seen in the Arab countries has forced a lot of the people to move their money out of those places. They were gonna put it in Europe. Now they can't put it in Europe, so they're bringing it to North America and investing in projects as opposed to putting it in banks. Now that brings up the point that tonight at five o'clock, we have a two or three or even four hour meeting over in the Newcastle Town Hall with uh, an organization that wants to put up some wind farms here. And I'm sure it's going to be loaded with NIMBYs. Oh, so what, what's your position on, on, on the future <laughs> of big wind in Ontario, particularly Durham region, uh, when we get all these uh, Bay Street lawyers collecting money in advance to represent NIMBYs? Well, I think there should be a season on it. You know what? I don't even remember that this is now called a biomass. Well. Huh? What's that? Sorry? Sorry? Can I tell you my favorite uh, NIMBY story? <laughs> What's your favorite NIMBY story? Favorite NIMBY story. We're doing this project in Aurora for a uh, local cable internet company. And uh, they were running a, what they call their head end, which their data center, basically. At the end of a residential street, at the end of a residential single phase power line. They were talking about a fair bit of power back in there and they, have, they always have electrical problems. They call us in to sort of, sort of some of their electrical problems and one thing or another, we finally decided to put in a behind the meter system at their head end to alleviate this problem. We were gonna put up three of those same turbines in the town here you know, there. By the way, those three turbines, those turbines are so quiet that in all the ones we've got erected, in all the places, and all the times I've visited them, I've only actually, actually ever heard one once. And I was right at the base in a high wind behind a building. So I, I wasn't getting the wind, but the turbine was, and I was close, and I actually heard it. Yeah. Anyway, we we're gonna put up three of these little turbines in this little kind of a valley. And these three turbines were just gonna poke up over the tree ridge. Yeah, by about 15 or 18 feet. About 15 feet. Now, if you went about three miles the other side of that ridge, there was a little subdivision there carved out of the Oak Ridge of the Moraine. <laughs> and there were these bunch of NIMBYs living in there who were convinced that these three little turbines were going to keep them all awake all night. And their kids were all going to die from lack of sleep. And, and, uh, and the loudest of this bunch um, 
the only place where he could actually see the turbines, he went to the end of his driveway and leaned over and looked between his house and the next, and way over there was where the turbines were gonna be. By the way, between those two houses were two, two and a half ton air conditioners. Right. Running about 68 decibels each. For 90. 90. 92 each. Yeah, all right? You couldn't hurt yourself, think, let alone hear the turbines. Anyway, we're sitting down and meeting with these people, trying to be nice. And we start off by saying, you know, your neighbor here, we're a cable internet, uh, they're trying to do a good thing here. They're trying to be green. They're trying to reduce the load on your and on the power line that comes past everybody's house. They're trying to generate power to make it easier for everybody. They're trying to keep their costs down so they don't have to charge more for cable, blah, blah, blah. And they kind of cut us off and said, no, don't give us any of that green crap. You guys are just in this for the money. Well, there's some justice in that. You know, we are doing this to make money. That's one of the reasons. So anyway, we went on and we got on the subject of kind of the large industrial um, grid supply turbines, like really big ones. And they said, now, how do they get those things in? You know, how do they get them past the neighbors? We said, well, frankly, in some cases, what they do, if you live within so many hundred uh, meters of one of those turbines, you get a little so much per kilowatt kickback to, you know, ease the pain of living in your turbine. And this woman who had accused us of being in it for the money said, oh, well, if you guys are willing to pay me, I'll withdraw my objection. To the other gentleman that's here, and this is for both of you, um, I happen to have some connections at McLean's editorial staff, and they are looking for an article, and McLean's is a big magazine, mm -hmm. well read in Ontario. And they are looking for an uh, opportunity to interview people like you for a major story on the solar future of Ontario. Right. So if you're interested, Absolutely. we'd be glad as a school to work with you because it would be your company and our organization that would provide the material mm -hmm. to go into a major McLean's magazine. And it could even be part of it on the cover. Absolutely. And that will be probably for June or July of this year. Excellent. So I want you to know that. And uh, so, me, Tom, uh, busy. <laughs> if you don't if you don't subscribe to McLean's magazine, you should, because when you do, they'll give you a little gift that I'm going to give you. Oh, thank you McLean's. so much. Okay. okay. Now, like also, like um, CAA, right? so. we we do want to hopefully get some work with you.